Hi everyone, today I'm going to show you how I write some basic structural calculations. The reason I'm showing you this is because so many new graduates entering the industry simply do not know how to set up calculations. Even engineers with a few years experience set up their calculations pretty poorly. Here are a few re reasons why this is important. It looks good and therefore gives a very good first impression. If your calculations are laid out neatly and in a good order, they are easy to read and understand. If they're easy to read and understand, it makes internal reviews, checks, really easy and also building control won't come back with any comments. Whilst this example is very basic, it shows you a backbone on how you'll eventually set up more complex calculations. I like producing my calculations in handwritten format and then supplementing with computerised output. It is very common nowadays for engineers to write all their calculations on the computer. Whatever method you opt to use, you should always structure your calcs. I would always recommend that young engineers write their calculations by hand first. Get that skill up first before advancing to computerising calculations. Graduates take computer programs for granted without fully understanding the process which will come back to bite them later in their career. Something that I was taught and has stuck by me ever since was that your calculation should read like a story or a book. It should be very fluid when you read through it. You always want to start off your calculations with an introduction, explain the problem, what you're planning to do and what assumptions you have made. Remember that engineers make assumptions and it is important to state what they are. If anything should go wrong, the calculations are the first things to be looked at. If you, hadn't, if you haven't written assumptions down, you could be in some serious trouble. Loadings is a prime example of an assumption and is something that should be written out clearly. With experience, you'll get a good grasp of what values are correct. So here I am listing out the floor buildup and their corresponding loads. This is a pretty standard timber floor buildup within a domestic home. Finishes could be carpet or tiled flooring. Timber floor boards are pretty standard, which are overlaying over the timber joist. Lastly, you should consider a load for the ceiling plasterboard and some services. I like to write the floor build up as how it would be built, as it gives me a reminder to make sure that I've considered everything, and it just makes sense too. I know that there is, there is an existing wall to consider in my calculations, so I have made an assumed load for the wall. I have gone for a worst case wall thickness of 215mm, which is a standard block laid flat. It would not be unreasonable to assume that both sides would have some sort of plasterboard and a finish as well. What I have forgotten to show here is the imposed loads that I will be using. I will be adding these into the section later. A great feature about GoodNotes is the ability to add a new page with the current template by simply dragging across the screen. Here I am importing the architect's drawing so that I can mark it up slightly. I mark on where the new beam is going to go and, an and annotate it to give it some context. It is important to do this so that it is clear to the reader or checker as to where the beam you are about to design is going. The architect didn't draw any sections but he did send me some elevations. So I chose to do a little sketch section through the building showing the new beam. I add dimensions, joist band direction and some text. A picture is worth a thousand words, it's quite fitting here. It is very easy now to know what I am designing and how it relates within the building. By doing all this, it really makes you understand the problem and it will show whoever is reading the calculations that the problem was properly understood. There is no point in solving a half understood problem. I am drawing the section using the good notes functions. As you can see, it can be quite limiting to draw the finer details. Alternatively, what I would do is if I needed to draw a more intricate section, I would first draw it in the concepts app and then copy it into good notes. If the architect has a section drawn already, I would repeat the process I showed earlier by importing the drawing into GoodNotes and doing a markup. What makes the section really useful is that it shows very clearly what is loading the beam that we are going to design in the next step. As we can see, the first floor joists are spanning onto the new wall as well as the wall above. What I didn't make clear is the roof trusses don't span onto the first floor wall. It is important to add dimensions, as the dimensions that you show will be used in the design later on. 
Now that the problem is understood, it is time to solve it by designing the correct beam section. It is good practice to write out your calculations fully. If you remember back in school maths exams, you would get points for showing you are working. Well, it is time to put that into practice. By doing this, it makes it really easy for the reader to understand and follow. It also makes self-checking your work easy, something which definitely needs to be done. First, I quickly describe that the beam is to be analysed as a simply supported beam, and my reasoning is because it will be bearing onto pad stones. As rotation isn't fixed, the support conditions are simple. I draw a free body diagram of the simply supported beam and label it with a length. I also show that the loading condition is a uniformly distributed load. I work out the loading onto the beam, first by calculating what the tributary length is. From the previous section where I drew a section, I show that the building width was 7.9 metres. The amount of floor area loading the beam is going to be half that. Once we have the trib length, we can work out what the load per unit length is by multiplying the areas we first assumed on page 1. I break this down into dead and live loads and multiply per the corresponding safety factors as per the euro codes. This does seem like a long drawn out process, but I can assure you that it is crucial. By taking the time to do these steps will help eliminate possible mistakes. Remember that mistakes as a structural engineer can be very costly, not just financially if a building collapses, but in terms of health and safety. Our priority as an engineer is to provide a fundamentally safe but efficient solution. A side note, a really good book which I still use to this day is Design of Structural Elements by Chanakya Arya. Apologies if I pronounced the author wrong. You want to add up the total loads both in terms of unfactored and factored loads. These are described as serviceability limit state and ultimate limit state in the Euro codes. For a quick guide on the Euro codes, do check out the iStructure guidance documents. If you feel a video going through the Euro codes is useful, please drop me a comment. Here I remember that I didn't annotate my sketch with the height of the wall. I also realised that I forgot to note down the imposed loads in my main loading assumptions back on page 1. You can find the imposed load values in Euro code 1, 1. Once you have the loads worked out, you can then calculate the bending moment and the shear forces. It is a simply supported beam with a UDL, so the equations are pretty straightforward. W over L squared over 8 for bending moment and WL over 2 for the shear force. Remember that lowercase w is load per unit length and uppercase w is total load across the beam length. Some textbook examples will use lowercase w and some will use uppercase w, so make sure you know the difference. Good practice is to make sure you always write out the units. In this problem, because we are supporting an existing wall, we want to keep deflections low. Typically, you would want to limit deflection to span over 500 or maximum 5mm. In this case, 5mm is the critical value. The deflection in, in a steel beam is governed by the second moment of area, so we rearrange the deflection equation for a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load to find the second moment of area. I've seen many graduates struggle with this part simply because they get the units wrong. Make sure you are consistent with your units. I'm used to using newtons and millimetres, so I tend to, tend to convert all my units to those. Once I've done the calculation, I can then convert that into a more sensible unit if required. In this case, I converted the units in centimetres to the four. The reason for this is because I select the beam from the Tata Steel Blue Book, which is a big book of beams which lists a whole lot of beam properties. I am choosing a 203 by 203 by 46 UC section because the second moment of area is greater than my required value I just calculated. Also, the bending moment resistance is also greater than the design value I calculated earlier. From experience, I know that the shear force is not critical, therefore I don't check it. I would advise less experienced engineers to check it and get familiar with the calculation. 
Only then will you understand why the shear force isn't critical in this situation. Thank you for watching, and I hope you find this video useful. If you have any comments please or would like me to cover any topics in particular, really please let me know.